Parenting is hard. Few of us feel up to the task. The world is shifting, quickly and dramatically. All of us feel the changes affecting our families. The stress and pressure can be intense. We are here to help sort the good and the bad, provide insight and bring hope. Welcome to Brilliantly Brave Parenting. We're so glad you stopped by. Hi, and welcome to Brilliantly Brave Parenting. I am your co-host, Pastor Brad Mathias. Hey, Brad. I'm Robert. <laughs> yes, that's good. You know your was name. Was that your stomach that just growled nope. on our intro? No, it wasn't mine. I think it might have been. I had a good lunch, but that wasn't mine. Okay. Well, it's good to be with you. It is good to be with you, and we're in the studio today with some special guests that we're going to get to in a minute. We're yep. not ignoring them, but you and I are going to... We're going to have this awkward conversation like they're not in the room. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So don't look at them, and, and then they're if not here. If you don't here. make eye contact, they're not really here. And if you watch on YouTube, you can see just how awkward Robert is, so... <laughs> That's right. I have some information that might be helpful for you, Robert. Do you know how Sundays got their name? I do. Because you read the same fact sheet. <laughs> yes, but I'm let's, sure our listeners let, don't. Let's pretend you don't. Okay how, no, okay, how do they get their names? So, Robert, let's start over. Do you know how Sundays get their name? No idea. Oh, wow. Well, let me tell you, because okay. it's really interesting. Sundays actually got their name because of the day of the week. In the late 1890s, a few states passed laws prohibiting the sale or consumption of ice cream on Sundays. It was hmm. considered immoral and improper for religious reasons, but... Ice cream lovers like you found a loophole, and they simply served ice cream with toppings. So it wasn't illegal. Mm. They became known as Sundays. What? That doesn't make sense. It's still ice cream. Robert? How's that a loophole? Some kind of legal loophole. I'm sure you could have figured that out. I mean, if you lived in the 1890s, you would have been at the head of the Ice Cream Reformation League. Yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't even make to make it's a like legal, a prohibition on ice cream. I mean that that can't be God's will. It's like you putting, you know, a headdress on and saying because I have a headdress I'm now Native American. That doesn't make you Native American. It just makes you Caucasian with a headdress. Did you take your meds today? I did. All right. I did absolutely. That just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I, it's clever and it makes for good conversation, look, I guess. But. This is a historical <clears throat> fact that I didn't even make up, and somehow you're attacking my logic for this historical fact. The interesting thing is that you don't cite any references. I'll put it on the show notes. Okay. Yeah. So like just come that. to brilliantlybraveparenting.com. You can check out the website. You can see this particular episode post, and there will be a link. <laughs> to this law that was on the books at some point for crazy people in New York who didn't think ice cream was spiritual. Who? Aren't are you glad we've moved past that? <laughs> Slightly, yes, I am. <laughs> Both historically am. and in this interview? All right. Yeah. Well, today we have some special guests. Uh, these are friends of ours that go back many years, uh, Natalie and Andrew Fockel, and welcome to Brilliantly Brave Parenting. In the oh, studio. Look, now we're looking at them. here with us. Hello. We're glad to be here. <laughs> and I'm glad I came on a day where I now know where the origin, where Sundays originated from. It's fascinating, yeah. right? It's worth the trip. Yeah. Enriched. Yes. Well, you know, and thank goodness we've had some reformation <laughs> mm -hmm. from those laws because I like ice cream specifically on Sundays. So. Mm -hmm. I haven't tracked my habits like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Maine, they have blueberry ice cream. Oh. And, uh, turns out to be fantastic. So hmm. if you're ever okay. up there, you should try it. Okay, back to our topic. Um, you guys have been through a significant journey in your marriage over <clears throat> the last 10 years. And rather than me uh, speak for you, I'd love for you to tell our audience just a little bit about your story. And then we can talk about what you've been through and what God's shown you through that journey. Yeah, so we've been married for about uh, 14 years. We met in college. And... Um, we struggled with uh, infertility for just about over 10 years. Um, wow. So we started trying to have a family back in, I think, 2008 was mm -hmm. when we started. And, um, you know, after, I don't know, close to a year or so, um, you know, realized we probably needed some help and started the whole journey of doctor's visits and, you know, things escalating month by month, year over year, and started um, going from basic medications to... Um, you know, relatively minor procedures all the way up to, through uh, in vitro fertilization, which is pretty much the granddaddy of, in, of fertility treatments. Um, had some miscarriages, failed treatments along the way, and um, and then eventually, finally, 
uh, was able to have a child through a, a gestational surrogate, so somebody who carried the pregnancy for us. But um, yeah, it was a long, long, hard, hard trip over the 10 years. 10 years of struggling through that. Yeah. It's crazy when we think about it, to hear, even to hear it out loud. Is yeah. like you never imagined that would be your story. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't, doesn't even feel real and that it, that it was 10 years. Well, I think it's admirable that you, I mean, that you keep trying. It had to be discouraging. Mm. Oh, and sure. <clears throat> how did you guys deal with that? How did you guys keep going? I think it was just the deepest longing of our hearts to be parents. And <clears throat> um, we just both really believed that we were going to have a biological child. Um, and we had considered the option of adoption. Um but it just didn't feel like what God was asking us to do. And uh, I'm a pretty tenacious and determined person. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I said, it was the deepest desire of our hearts. So it was just something we couldn't shake. We just had to just keep trying. And we certainly lost hope uh, many times throughout the journey. I'm but sure. um, we just, we were crazy enough to believe that our God could do it. And we didn't know how it would look, but... We just uh, held each other up when the other was down and had a great uh, community supporting us. And we've been very public with our story really since the beginning. So um, in some ways that makes it really hard because you can't Mm -hmm. hide in the hard times. But in some ways it it was what kept us going because when we couldn't hope, we had our support system hoping for us and with us. Hmm. So you say you've been very public. Uh, What do you mean by that? How, How are you public? Um, once we got past the initial testing um, and decided to start proceeding with procedures, um, we started blogging about it and um, inviting people to just journey along this with us. We had no idea at that point. I think we were maybe three or four years into our journey at that point. And I think we had no idea that it would be another six or seven years until it would actually happen. But Um, We just started blogging and inviting people into our journey and um, just sharing all the details about um, the the wins and the losses and the losses of the pregnancies and um, the loss of hope and um, the revamping of hope and um, the other things that were keeping us going. And um, yeah, I'm not looking back. I'm not sure why we decided to be so public about it. (laughs) I don't I don't really regret it. But it was harder than I than we initially thought it would be. We thought we'd be public about it and then have this great great ending to our story maybe a year later. But um, we had a lot of people hang in there with us throughout the years. So it's a beautiful story. I'm I'm curious to dig a little deeper just from the dynamics of um, marriage and being a couple. For sh- I, I'm sure that you weren't always completely well. Maybe you were. Let me start there. Were you always on the same page? Both of you felt like, yes, we can do this. Or were there ever times where one was like, I don't know. I just don't, I don't know. I want to give up or I want to, you know, because I would think if I were putting myself in the position, my wife and I, I mean, you know, if we want to buy a pan, we're like on different, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's some uh-huh. things that really make sense. And there's other things that are like, were you guys always kind of harmonious or what, were there times where you guys in different places? Yeah, I think um, there definitely were times we were in different places. And, um, you know, listening to her talk about her tenaciousness is something that I've always loved about her and probably the reason we have a child because, you know, there were definitely times, especially for me, you know, when it got time to go to the next level of, you know, treatment or, the you know, the next uh, more intense, you know, level of testing and medication or procedures, um, I was definitely the one who was more hesitant or, you know, Mm. just, um, scared. And, um, there were some times when I just thought, well, this is it, we can't do it anymore. And, you know, we definitely both desired to be parents, but I think for Natalie, especially that, that was just such, um, such a part of what she knew was, she was meant to be that, you know, I just saw that, you know, there's no way we can stop. And, you know, it, it was, it was definitely, um, took some, working out between the two of us, but um, mm-hmm. I'm glad we stuck it out. But yeah, we, I think as the years went on, we thankfully, um, because it's, you know, it's not always the case when, when a couple goes through something like this, it can very, uh, it, it unfortunately often can lead to couples, you know, marriages splitting or relationships being harmed yeah. because it's so intense. 
And thankfully for us, by God's grace, it brought us more and more together. So I mm-hmm. think as the years went on, we'd certainly probably got more and more on the same page just because, you know, when you go through something like that with somebody, if it doesn't tear you apart, it really does bond you yeah. closer and closer together. And I'm thankful for that because we have the kind of marriage that we do now because we went through that together. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Right. Well, I know that, and that's, it was kind of a loaded question because I know that that, you know, anytime you add, being married is hard to begin with, mm-hmm. yeah. <clears throat> bringing two, two completely different cultures together. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you throw a dynamic like that, like we've, we've talked to a couple people um, of late, you know, that have special needs kids mm-hmm. or adopt or whatever. And there's just so much work that goes into that and mm-hmm. so much more taxing yeah. um, emotions and, and that kind of thing. So I, you know, kudos to you, first of all, for, for doing that. But what would you say to the, to the mom or dad out there that have been trying for years and one is just going, I'm just tired of thinking about this. Like, you know, um, and the other one's just like you, just feeling this is what's supposed to be. What would you say to the, that couple out there that might be in that place of, because honestly, <clears throat> the reason I'm, I'm approaching this from this standpoint is I don't want to see marriages break up. I, I mean, there are, those, those things are important. Having kids are important, but the dynamic of how you get there is as important mm-hmm. as you know, Mm -hmm. having children. So what would you say to them? I think, first of all, I would just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're even in the position to have to be thinking through this and finding the common ground between the two of you. It wasn't meant to be this way. And it's a lonely journey. Uh, Even if you're completely united with your spouse, it's a really lonely journey. And Mm -hmm. especially if you're not united with your spouse, it's even lonelier. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's heartbreaking. So first of all, I'm so sorry for that. Um, Second of all, I think um, it's important to realize how much you need your spouse. As much as Hmm. I used to tell Andrew, like, I need to have a baby like I need air to breathe. This has to happen. But I also needed Andrew to hold me up and be my support through that. So without him, I'd have nothing. And so um, it's important to, if you're the, if you're the person longing um, more than your spouse or pushing harder than your spouse, I think it's important to remember to step back and see your spouse for who they are mm-hmm. and for what they bring to your life and to realize that they need to be heard and they you need to understand where they're coming from, even if it's not where you are you are, um, even if it's not where you are coming from, it's important to just be able to step back and try to see it from their perspective and um, just offer compassion and empathy toward them and um, just hang in there. We also are huge components of counseling. Yeah. And um, I I don't know if we'd be married (laughs) still if we didn't have an amazing counselor. And, uh, I think I think everyone should should do that, and um, if you get yourselves a good counselor that you can both trust and depend on together, uh, that added support system can really help you see the other person's perspective a lot better. Right. Yeah, definitely the counseling piece that was was one of the things that came to my mind first, um, and just in general, you know, the, it can be such a lonely journey mm-hmm. doing this, and and. Um, it's not talked about a lot, uh, although there are a lot more people going through than we realize, which we didn't even know until we started going into it. And, you know, slowly and little by little, the, the stories come out of, you know, people you had no idea struggling yeah. with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it's definitely not a journey you want to take alone. And mm-hmm. the tricky part about that is not everybody is equipped to walk with you on that journey. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I would say um, it's really important to try to find those safe people to to um you know walk alongside you with and they may not be the people who you think they'll be right. they mm-hmm. may not actually even be you know family cuz it it gets so messy um and complicated sometimes going through this with family who who loves you and who wants this for you but doesn't know you know sees you in pain and doesn't know how to help uh, you know mm-hmm. necessarily and it and it also may not be um you know we we saw a lot of our relationships change when we started going through this you know when we were you know, first, we were one of the first couples out of, you know, a group of friends that was started trying to have kids. Um, and, you know, slowly, one by one, every couple started having their first child and then their second child. And 
um, without any of us trying, the hmm. dynamic of those relationships changed, yeah. you know, because the focus of life for those new parents yeah. changed as well they should. But, yeah. um, you know, relationships that were safe and close and, you know, looked a certain way before that started changing. And so, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily those relationships that were the safe places for us during this journey. And I think just letting yourself, letting, giving yourself permission that that's okay, that you're not mm. doing something wrong, that mm -hmm. they're not doing something wrong intentionally. You know, if, if, you know, your best friend suddenly becomes a new parent, they're not able, you're not able to relate to each other in the same way. And there's some grieving that goes along mm -hmm. with that, you know, and it's natural and it's hard, but it's um, just realizing that, you know, that relationship may look a little bit different and, it may be a different person who can be that safe place for you to, you know, to go to in the ups and downs. So, you know, I would say don't give, don't give up hope if you haven't found that safe person, but definitely don't try to do it alone. That's great. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm listening to uh, just sort of the, the wisdom that you're sharing with the audience right now for the families that are in the middle of uh, battling through infertility and, you know, they're, there are a significant number of options mm -hmm. for for couples to consider in uh, treatment, mm -hmm. and most of them are uncomfortable and expensive, mm -hmm. and um, not even that high a probability of success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so there has to be um, sort of a protection of that heart desire to have a child together. You guys walked through that for a long time, mm -hmm. and obviously you had support. You obviously had the right uh, pieces in your life to keep your marriage strong or, or at least healthy enough to get through this, mm -hmm. and now you've emerged on the other side. This is really good advice, but at some point, this process had to have changed you. So my question is, how, how would you say going through this together changed you individually and as a couple? Mm, that's a good question. <clears throat> I know that, um, I think I think it changed us for the better all the way around. I think it made us stronger all the way around. And I definitely believe with my whole heart that it made us better parents because you better believe we won't take a second for granted and we are present and um, just, He's our, he's our little world right now. Um, but I think outside of our parenting, I think uh, it's given us an awareness and a new level of empathy for people who are struggling with other illnesses, cancer, or people who have just lost a spouse or a family member. And, you know, all those, all those people who are in, that, in the midst of suffering, even if it doesn't look like suffering through infertility, those people have an enormous amount of support around them when the incident first happens, when someone first get diagno gets diagnosed with an illness or when someone first loses a spouse or when someone first finds out they are struggling with infertility. And then life moves on naturally, and, and those people start to dwindle, and that support system starts to get hmm. a little bit more distant. And those people feel like the people that are suffering – feel like life is passing them by and they're watching it but that they they can't they can't keep up life is not happening for them but they're watching life happen all around them mm. and um i don't think we would have been able to have that awareness had we not gone through this um and i'm thankful for that awareness because i hope that we can serve those people and be that kind of a support for those people that are in the midst of suffering and feeling like everyone else is moving on with their life. And um, I hope that that can be part of our, our mission going forward. Yeah. I think that's <clears throat> so well said. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a good reminder to those of us that are on the other side of, <clears throat> of having gone through a struggle, whether it be infertility or illness or divorce or whatever mm -hmm. to, you know, to have the empathy to look back and <clears throat> that others, you know, I think about the story where the lepers were cured by Jesus and, you know, one came back out of the group that, you know, and, and like what you're talking about is kind of going back and, and, and being that empathetic voice and mm. that caring, you know, so I think that's, that's a really good thing to come out from. Um, but that didn't end there. 
you did have success. You mm-hmm. do have a son. Now talk us about talk to us about like the last process of of getting to the place where it did work. And mm-hmm. obviously there's had to be some trepidation about okay, we're gonna try this way now, mm-hmm. or we're gonna try this. And so it's exhausting in some ways, thinking, okay, mm-hmm. we're gonna just another thing. But um you walk through it and it seemed tell us the story. Yeah, so it's it was such a definitely not a, a linear journey of you know we're going to try this this didn't work okay we're going to do this and then now we're going to move on to this you know it, it it probably was that way for the first maybe five or six years and then after we got to the point where we realized that doing IVF just wasn't going to work for us you know we we got to a point where we just didn't really know what came next and you know as Natalie shared we had considered adoption and um, just didn't feel like that was what we were being called to do at that point in our lives. Um, Although there was kind of a, through the last few years, there were a few times when it would kind of come up and we would think, oh, maybe this is something we're supposed to do and we'd be open to it and it kind of seemed like that door would shut. So um, eventually when we, um, when we realized that we were going to look into gestational surrogacy and it was somebody that we knew and had um, actually offered to do this for us to carry a pregnancy, um, which it was it was our genetic embryo. It was something that you know they actually are able to freeze embryos through which IVF. Which amazing, is, yeah, mm-hmm. so absolutely. So amazing. Our, our baby was frozen in New York for the first five years of <laughs> oh my gosh. yeah, which is crazy to think of. He just had a birthday, so we don't know if he's one or six. six. <laughs> <clears throat> he acts like he's six. Yeah, he does. <clears throat> that's incredible. So, um, you know, the way things progress, it. It was kind of a wild story of how everything lined up for this um, last piece of it to work. Um, and, you know, it kind of looked like going into it, it was just going to be this perfect, amazing wrap up to these 10 years. Um, and unfortunately, along the way during the pregnancy, there was just some more, uh, some complications in the story. And that process wasn't as smooth as we had expected it to be. And, um, it was kind of, again, another level of grieving that we had to go through of, you know, even though hmm. we have a pregnancy, we're going to have a child, we still had to, to grieve that we didn't get to experience mm-hmm. a pregnancy the way that normal families do. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't get to carry and, and do a lot of those things, be present for, you know, the kicking and a lot of mm-hmm. those moments that, mm-hmm. you know, you think about when you think about pregnancy. So there was even kind of a new... Um, in some ways, reopening of some of those wounds during the final months of the pregnancy. Um, but, you know, at the end of it, and, and during that time, you know, we knew and we knew that it would be worth it. We knew that, you know, it was it was going to be worth the journey. Although when you're in it, it doesn't feel that way. And, you know, people out of love will tell you, yeah, it's going to be worth it. It's all going to mm-hmm. be worth it, which, you know, is not always helpful to hear. And even yeah. though you know that's true. You know, um, <laughs> it it certainly is on this side of it, um, but I think we kind of realized that um, even when even when it seemed like this journey was headed for you know this perfect conclusion, um, we had to trust God up until the very end and through you know through the the beginning of it for what His plans were that looked different than ours. Um, but we're glad that we stuck it out and we're glad Mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, it turned out the way that it did. Mm. Yeah. To add on to that, it's amazing that you can be so incredibly grateful for the fulfillment of what you really believed was his promises and the fulfillment of this, um, longing of over 10 years, uh, and be grieving at the same moment. Mm. And, um, you know, for every ultrasound that we were able to be present for, and with IVF babies, they're every, almost every appointment is an ultrasound, so it's a little bit different than a normal pregnancy, but for every ultrasound that we were able to be present for, we also had an audience. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the intimate Mm -hmm. moment of getting to experience the visual of seeing our baby by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We had um, another person in the room you know, laying on the table, carrying our baby. And um, while that's the most incredible, selfless gift someone could offer, it's also something to grieve when you're, you don't feel free to feel your emotions Mm. 
privately. You don't right. get to, to you don't get to feel them privately. And um, I didn't I didn't anticipate that going into it. Yeah. That wasn't something I, I wouldn't processed. Have that, but like, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So that really <clears throat> took us by surprise for sure. And then also navigating the birth and like this person just carried this baby for nine months, but you better believe I want to hold him immediately, you know? And like, is that selfish to not, Mm. you know, just all the different details that going into it, we didn't think through, we didn't process and it wouldn't have changed our decision, but it certainly uh, added such a heightened level of emotion and um, just confusion and, um, difficult circumstances to navigate so yeah i think um one thing that occurs to me is it probably was a really good preparation for parenting in that (laughs) there were so many things that were out of our control that we realized like we've got to be able to adapt to this and figure this out um and that's kind of what being a parent is like you know 100 percent. yeah especially when you've got 10 years where you kind of figure out how life works just the two of you and now all of a sudden it just gets blown up so Yeah, yeah as i'm listening to this it's uh, it's one of those things where you guys went through a process where you had this expectation mm. and then you had this experience. And that is like parenting. Mm. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that will be a theme for all time <laughs> with, with kids. But uh, you do have this added complexity, even messiness of, of a surrogate. Mm-hmm. And you've got your family to talk to. Mm-hmm. You got people in church who mm-hmm. may or may not like get that mm-hmm. or understand it or support it or maybe they just feel awkward. Mm-hmm. I mean, tell us just quickly. I'm, the producer's giving me number signs. So, <laughs> talk, how, how did you get through that? Because I know I don't even know for sure how that worked for you, but I know it had to be weird. So, how did you get through that? Uh, I was just going to say, thankfully, um, I actually. I'm a worst case scenario thinker, so I just assumed people would be really weirded out by it or Mm -hmm. not supportive or um, against it. But thankfully, I think God just brought the right group of people into our lives. And I I wasn't aware of anyone that felt that way. Um, There were a lot of people that had a lot of questions um, about technically how does it work and... um, it's all our genetics. Again, we froze that embryo long before we knew the surrogate. Um, but the whole the whole thing, we, we had a lot of different questions that came up, but not <clears throat> not anyone that was not supportive or not. Um, so the church community you're in supported this. Mm-hmm. Totally. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. And I think uh, for me, especially after you've been through something like that, you get to a point where you, you know, and I say this respectfully, but you kind of learn, you don't care necessarily as much about what people think because people are going to think what they're going to think and they, and they have the right to, but at the end of the day, you know, it's between you and God and your, and your wife and, you know, the the journey that he's brought you on is your journey. And so, you know, getting to the point where you're, you're a little bit more free of worrying about what's going to happen. You kind of lose that after, you know, 10 years of going through it. It's just like, you know what, you haven't been through this. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I appreciate your perspective, but we have our perspective too. Awesome. I'm I'm so glad you guys took time to be with us today. I mean, a lot, I mean, I could keep talking about this. I have so many other questions. (laughs) It's it's curious, isn't it? It it really is. It opens up the door to a lot of thoughts. But I think the primary thing is that you're talking about it and Mm -hmm. it's important for people to talk about it. So I'm grateful that, that you're here to start the conversation and, um, Applaud you and congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank Thanks you. for having us. We've been talking to Natalie and Andrew Fockel, and uh, you can find out more about them at their blog spot, which is to the number hearts one, the number hope dot blogspot dot com. That's two hearts, one hope blogspot dot com. You can read along, uh, experience the journey with them. Uh, infertility, our story is the main uh, summary page. And I would encourage you if you're, uh, if this topic is resonating with you or your family or someone you know, this is a really practical way to give you some encouragement. Thanks, guys. Thank Thank you. you. We are excited to announce the Storms of Life study, Living Beyond Stressed Out and Overwhelmed. It's a great subtitle, Living Beyond Stressed Out and Overwhelmed. Yeah, I mean, at this point, 
We know that students are stressed. And for parents and pastors, it's important to know what are the top three things that are really on the minds of our kids. So Brad, walk us through what they can expect from the Storms of Life. This is an eight-week study. It has uh, video insights. It has uh, presentations from a actual youth retreat with junior high and high school students. These kids are going to learn about how their faith can help them fight back the stress that they're living with every day at school. Check it out on iShineLive.com. Well, Robert, that was uh, that was an extraordinary conversation. Uh, I meant to, I could keep going. Yeah. I mean, there were so many, as every answer brought up another like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. What about this? And, you mm-hmm. know, and we were, had a chance to talk to them a little bit off recording or off air, as you would call it. And some, because, you know, one of the natural questions I had is, okay, so what's the relationship with the surrogate like and how does that? And, you know, it doesn't always go as you planned. And um, so there's there's a lot to this. Yeah, Nate, and just for our audience's uh, information, we, we did talk <clears throat> probably 10 minutes after the the interview here in the studio. And they, they shared some additional details to the story and have given us permission to share that with you. And one of the struggles that they, they shared was just, you know the the surrogacy, just that mother uh, relationship with was strained because it was a close friend, yeah. And that they recommended to uh, other couples that might be considering a surrogacy to work through an agency as a way of just protecting um, some of those relationships. Because pregnancy, I mean, I've never been pregnant, but um, have walked through some with my wife and you now my daughter, and there's a connection that happens when there's a baby inside you. That um, is, I can't imagine being in a position yeah. of giving up for adoption. Or I mean, those those are significant bonds. And so, if you haven't gone through an agency, or if it is just a personal friend that's willing to do this, just you know, get some counsel on that because it, that, there's something that happens academically. We can think that makes sense. I want to help. I want to care. But but when there's something that happens inside your body that is beyond just you know. The yeah. academic side, and there's a connection. It it can be very very complicated. Yeah, and and you know I think their uh, decision to do this was very specific to them mm-hmm. through a process that God revealed to them as they walked through a decade long journey. I, I think of Abraham and Sarah a little bit in the Bible. I think yeah. of you know the 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 prophet Samuel who was born after his mother dedicated herself to God, and you know there this seems to be one of the areas God works is in really in scripture is an in infertility where mm-hmm. God shows up and does things that are very unique and different for each family. Hmm. Excellent point. Um, but I, I do have to say that, you know, as they've been through this journey, they were very candid that, you know, they, they're not sure they would do it this way again. Um, mm-hmm. That, that was, we asked them that specifically. Yeah, we did. And, and, you know, they weren't of the same mind <clears throat> yet. Right. And, um, so I think for parents, if uh, if this is an well, area, one where- thing. Let me stop you for a second there, but yeah. because I don't want you to lose your train of thought. But one thing they were unified on is if they did do it again, they would go through an agency. Right. right. Yeah. Go on, sorry. Yeah. So for parents out there who are considering a surrogacy uh, for uh, for a pregnancy uh, for infertility, that we I would encourage you to reach out to this couple mm-hmm. to, to to Andrew and Natalie and and, and you know. Reach out to them through their blog and email them, Facebook them, whatever you can do to get a hold of them because they're open to talking to people to just give some really – some detail to this and and some good advice. Mm-hmm. Um, because Robert and I really – we're just trying to open the door to this conversation. We're not trying to finish the conversation here today. It's just meant to be an ex, uh, a point of illustration. So – that's right. And I would I would add to that the other thing that I, I left this conversation feeling kind of convicted on is um, many of us know somebody that's dealing with infertility. And I think their example is exactly right. And I felt this with divorce. It's a very similar thing. Like in the initial trauma of it, people are all around you. But the longer you live into being a solo parent or being in the infertility stage, the more that 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 net kind of just dissipates. And so for those of us that are not in the position of dealing with this, be aware that those the number one thing that I heard from them over and over was how for these 10 years they felt alone. And so I think that's that's a 
that's a call to us as the church to know that people walking through infertility need to know that they're seen and they're loved and that they're supported. So go the extra mile to um, try to find a way that you can love on those that are that are dealing with this because it's a very lonely road. Yeah, and I, not only did they use the term uh, lonely, but also grieve. Yeah, they were grieving uh, the loss of of some things in their life, and they were also uh, the the term that they used was left behind. Yeah, that they were stuck while their friends sort of went forward in life and and they couldn't keep up. Yep. And uh, that put a strain on relationships that they just could not fix because they suddenly weren't in the same sort of stage of life anymore. Yeah. Um, and so as a church, as pastors, as as men and women of, of belief and faith, I think the, the, the idea of starting to really look at your congregation or the people you're walking life <coughs> out with and identify those that might be struggling with this and really put them on your prayer list, put them on your, like, let's go to lunch or coffee list. Mm-hmm. Um, they need people with them as they're walking through this because there is a, a tremendous amount of pain that's hidden under the surface. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much for spending. This is a rich um, episode, and I'm so glad that we had this conversation. We're glad that you're with us. Um, one of our producers, Madison, is very, very on top of Brad, making sure that he cuts down on his long-windedness. So we're going to try to wrap it up here and let you know that we're thankful that, and we consider it an honor to speak into your lives. And uh, if you would do so, just leave us a comment and some stars, and uh, we'd be most grateful. And we'll see you here again next week. Brad? Goodbye. (laughs) See ya. Be encouraged, parents. You are not alone. In Paul's letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, he writes, But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Brilliantly Brave Parenting wants to be an encouragement and support that parents can rely on. Would you consider liking us and sharing us with a friend? As a part of the Tween Gospel Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization dependent on the support of friends like you. Thanks for stopping by. We'll be right here next week. Brad, you know I'm a foodie, right? Absolutely. Okay, I want to tell you about this awesome coffee experience. It's called CJ's Coffee Culture and Community. It is a faith-run coffee culture. And the thing that's really cool about this is that they roast their own beans, they have delicious coffees, and they they have two brick and mortar, so two coffee bars, as well as a virtual location at cjscoffeecafe.com. Here's the cool thing. They ship their beans, they ship their coffee anywhere in the world, so you don't just have to be in Texas to enjoy it. CJ's Coffee Culture and Community. Awesome. You know, Robert, every parent, every pastor is looking for resources that are new and insightful for their kids. So true. So so where do we go? Well, with the advent of iShineLive.com, we have a web store. And in that web store, we've got resources. Like what? We've got resources like Bibles. We've got devotionals. We even have journals for kids. You have music? We do have music. And video? Absolutely. Wow. And everything's been designed for the preteen and tween in your life. Who needs Amazon? iShineLive.com. Check it out.